All right, open your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 20, verse 20. Almost a month ago now, uh, my family and I arrived back here at the church after taking a, a quick trip out to Reno, and we, we were coming back for the wedding of Josh and Celesta, and you know we had RSVP'd, we'd said we were going to be here, and we planned to be here for the wedding, and you know we wanted to enjoy the whole thing. We were looking forward to seeing the vows and the rings and the kiss, um, but due to some severe storms, we had some rain, we had some ice. We had some snow. Uh, we got here a little late. We pulled into that parking lot uh, just in time to see the young couple having their pictures taken out there under the big oak tree. And so at that moment, we knew we'd missed the, the service, but we were, we were really grateful to still be here in time for the reception that was downstairs. And then after that, we came up here for a wonderful time of worship. It was really beautiful. But that day... You know, as we experienced lots of things we enjoyed, that day I, I also experienced something I didn't enjoy. It had nothing to do with them. It had everything to do with me. Uh, because I recognized a distressing reaction in myself that day. That day I noticed in myself a displeasure at being here at this building with it packed out with so many people in attendance and, and not having an important place in what was going on. And, and I have to admit, it, I was really bothered by it. I was just another face in the crowd, and I wasn't used to that. And the problem is, I should have been fine with that. I should have been perfectly fine with that. After all, I wasn't the one who'd put the time into getting to know the couple of the hour. I hadn't been the one who had, um, who had led them through weeks of premarital counseling. I wasn't the one who had worked on the wedding sermon or met with the families or walked everyone through the rehearsals. Neither was I the one who'd helped send out invitations or, or helped with the setup. I hadn't helped with the food preparation, none of that. In, in none of those things did I take part. So why would I now expect to have any part or, or any place close to the couple of honor on the day of their wedding. It was a ridiculous feeling. I was, and I was really bothered. I was really bothered that day by my own instincts of selfishness and self-importance and self-promotion that came out that day. I don't know if you've ever seen those things come out in yourself. Maybe, maybe you can't relate to my feelings that day, but maybe it's possible you felt something similar on some other occasion. Some other big event that you attended, maybe uh, it was a graduation or a conference or a party or, or some large banquet. It, it could be that you too have felt bothered by just being another face in the crowd when there's an important thing going on, an important event. It could be that you too have felt those same pangs of selfishness and self-importance and self-promotion start to stir inside of you. Maybe you've been at a conference and you know, somebody you knew way back when, you knew them in the past, maybe now they're a guest speaker. Wow, you know, you, before they were just so-and-so down the hall at your dorm, or maybe they were just a co-worker or a classmate. But now suddenly they're important. They're somebody popular. They're influential. And so maybe you catch yourself hoping they'll mention your name in a story. You're sitting there in the audience, and maybe you sat there just willing for them to notice you, hoping they'll pick you out in the crowd so that some of their importance will splash onto you. Maybe you've even gone so far, don't admit it if you have, but maybe you've even gone so far as to intentionally position yourself in one of the front two rows, just in the hopes that they'll notice you. Why do we do these things? Why do we do these things? Well, you know, so often it seems like when the spotlight is on someone else, we're like moths to a, a flame. We try to get as close to that person as possible, hoping, hoping some of the light that shines on them will also splash onto us. Why do we do that? Well, as fallen human beings, we do that because we're impossibly preoccupied with our own status and importance. When God created us, we were made to glorify Him. But sin causes us to constantly seek our own glory instead. It's, it's maddening. Even as Christians, we struggle to keep God's glory the priority. 
I won't ask you to raise your hands if you have that problem. And as we'll see in our text today, this concern with our own status and our own importance and greatness according to how the world sees greatness is nothing new. This this instinct towards selfishness and self-importance and self-promotion is nothing new. In fact, as we'll see in our text, this is even an attitude that creeps in among the disciples of Jesus. We left the disciples last week nearing Jericho. They were, they were on their way there on the pilgrim path, on their way to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. But if we look back even to before they began that journey south, we can notice a few reoccurring themes that lead up to our text today. So I want to kind of review some of those themes so we see where this fits in. One of those reoccurring themes seems to be Jesus dealing with this issue of greatness, of self-importance. In chapter 18, for instance, we saw this question raised by the disciples. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? They asked Jesus. And in response, Jesus brought forward a little child and basically said, someone like this is the greatest. He meant someone who was humble. He meant someone who saw themselves the way the society of their day saw little children, as powerless and weak, dependent, poor, simple, and trusting. That's the way we must see ourselves before God, Jesus says. If, if we want to be great in God's eyes, if we want to be great according to God, that's the way we must see ourselves if we want to be great in God's kingdom, Jesus says. Then in chapter 19, we saw Jesus come to the defense of parents who were bringing little children to him for blessing. They were all gathered around him like these kids were up here, all all coming to Jesus. And the disciples are trying to push him away. You know, Jesus has more important things to do. And Jesus says, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And so again, he was making the point that it's people who are like children people who are childlike towards God, who have the greatest claim on the kingdom of God. Then came the story of the rich young ruler, right? He was was a great man according to the world. He was a man of influence. He was a man of wealth. He was a man who was dependent on no one. But in the end, he went away sad. In the end, we saw he walked away from Jesus. He walked away from God's kingdom. It's hard for great men of the world to get into heaven, Jesus says. So hard it's impossible. Why? Why why is it impossible? It's impossible because to get into the kingdom of heaven, we have to become great according to God. We have to become like children. We have to see ourselves like a child. No money, no power, no leverage. No hope of survival unless someone outside of ourselves comes to our rescue. Unless someone outside of ourselves has mercy on us and takes care of us. But this is is impossible if we want to be great the way the world sees great. Because that kind of great man wants to be the biggest, he wants to be the best, he wants to be the boss, and he wants to be at the beginning of every line. That's great according to the world. While the ones who are great according to God are the little, the least, the lost, and the last. Those are the ones who are great according to God. And so in chapter 20, we looked at the parable of the workers in the vineyard and saw that the last will be first and the first will be last. What we see is that over and over again, Jesus has been dealing with this issue of greatness, but now it comes up again today as Two of the twelve make a play for power and prestige with the help of their mother. Look with me now at verses 20 through 21. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him, came up to Jesus with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, what do you want? She said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit one at your right hand, and one at your left in your kingdom. What is, she, what is she asking for her sons? She is asking for greatness. But let's slow things down. Let's, let's walk through these two verses to see what kind of greatness she's seeking for them. Let's, 
Let's start by looking back at verse 20, which begins with these words, the mother of the sons of Zebedee. First of all, who is this? Who is this? Well, the sons of Zebedee are who? James and John, right? They are the the fishermen. They are the brothers, James and John. Uh, And in Matthew 27, 56, we again see their mother, the mother of the sons of Zebedee, mentioned in a list of women who are at the cross when Jesus is crucified. Now, what's helpful about that list of women who are at the cross, what's, what's helpful about that is that this same list also appears in the Gospels of Mark and John. Except that in those, those Gospels, this list is worded a little bit differently, which means, but the same people are there. And so we find out a little bit more about the mother of the sons of Zebedee. So that in Mark's list, we see that their mother seems to be a woman by the name of Salome. And in John's list, she further seems to be identified as the sister of Jesus' mother, Mary. Maybe you never noticed that. In other words, she's not just the mother of James and John. It's possible she's also Jesus' aunt. Okay, so why, is that, why would that be important? Well, I think it's important because, because Matthew is wanting to show us these two apostles trying to work the system the same way the world works the system when it comes to going after greatness, right? Because because it's a who-you-know world, isn't it? Even today. And in a who-you-know world, then as now, I think we probably all know that family connections can get you extra far. But why does their mother make the request and not James and John? That's always interesting to me. After all, they're family too, right? If if their mom is really Jesus' aunt, it means they're Jesus' cousins. So why don't they ask? Well, I think there's a couple reasons. First, I think Salome asks because I don't think she was included in hearing Jesus' third passion prediction, and James and John know this. You remember, we saw last week that Jesus seemed to pull aside only the twelve. And he told them, again, he was going to Jerusalem, he was going to be betrayed, he was going to suffer, he was going to be crucified. And so it's possible that she still knows nothing about his latest shocking announcement of suffering and death. Otherwise, I don't think she would have agreed to go along with this plan. Maybe I'm wrong, but I'd like to think the best of Salome. So I don't think she would have gone along with this if she had just heard what James and John heard. And so it's possible the last thing she heard from Jesus' mouth was the promise to the twelve that they would all sit on twelve thrones and rule with him in his kingdom. And so, hey, if if there's going to be twelve thrones, she's going to do what's best for her sons and try to get two thrones in the best position. Um, Second, I I think Salome makes this request instead of her sons Because history has taught them that when a situation calls for an especially delicate touch, a woman can sometimes get away with asking for things that even a male relative can't get away with. Do we have any examples of this in the Bible? I know you all are thinking of examples, but I'm talking about biblically, do we have any examples of this? And so I think of Abigail in 1 Samuel 25, bowing before King David to intercede for the life of of her foolish husband Nabal. I think of Bathsheba in 1 Kings chapter 1, bowing again before King David to intercede for her son Solomon. I think of Queen Esther in Esther chapter 8, falling at the feet of King Ahasuerus to plead for the safety of the Jews. I think of Mary in John 2, asking Jesus to solve the wine shortage at the wedding at Cana. I think of Herod's stepdaughter in Matthew 14, asking for the head of John the Baptist when no one else could. And in each case, it was was a woman who approached a king and received what she asked for. They've got all these examples in their history. And now I think James and John are betting on that same winning winning formula to work again. And so, kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, what do you want? She said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your kingdom. 
Now, it seems to me anyway that the other disciples aren't around at this point. I think, I think these three, these conspirators here, I think they've been biding their time. I think they've been looking for just the right occasion to come to Jesus in private. And I say that because it's not until verse 24 that the others seem to catch wind of this request. And so first, Salome bows and asks Jesus for something. For something, the text says. And it's a little strange the way it's worded. It's a little, it seems intentionally vague. It's worded as if she's, she's being slightly manipulative, manipulative like, like I know none of you have experienced this, but like when a child comes up and says, I want you to promise me something. And they don't tell you what they want you to promise first. And they, you know, they insist that you agree. They insist you'll agree on promising before you know what it is. But Jesus asks for specifics. And he said to her, what do you want? So she clarifies. She clarifies. And the ESV version has her now asking Jesus to say this will happen. Say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your kingdom. But instead of say, the word say, give me your word, is probably closer to the sense of what she's saying. So she's coming to Jesus, she's bowing down before him like somebody would before a king, and she's asking Jesus to make her a promise that most benefits her boys, like any good mother would. A promise that will benefit after all, their shared family interests, like any aunt of the day would. To promise that her sons, and by extension, his cousins, after all, would get the best thrones in the house when it comes time to seat the twelve in order of importance on the twelve thrones Jesus mentioned earlier. And so she asks for the places at your right hand and at your left. And maybe you all know this, but the place or seat on a king's right hand was traditionally the place of greatest honor and authority, while the seat to his immediate left was either of equal importance or only slightly less importance. And, and this seemed to hold true if you've, if you've read through the Old Testament, if you've, if you've read in the New Testament, this seems to hold true, <clears throat> whether one's referring to seating in the royal court or seating at a banquet table, as we see in Jesus' parable at the wedding, about the wedding in Luke 14. The most highly sought-after positions of honor were those, those closest in proximity to the host. It is always the case, writes R.C. Sproul, that glory overflows from those who are in positions of power to those who are closest to them. And whenever someone comes to a position of power, be it a king or a president or a superintendent on the job, people scramble to get close to the seat of power. Anybody, anybody relate to that? When the spotlight is on someone, we're drawn to them like moths to a flame. We, we want to be as close to them as possible so that some of that light will splash over onto us. We were made to glorify God. We were made to reflect His greatness to the world. But sin causes us to constantly seek our own glory instead. Well, how does Jesus respond to this request? Look now at verse 22. Jesus answered, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said to Him, We are able. The you here is plural. In other words, Jesus isn't just saying this response to Salome who, who asked him the question. He's, instead, he's responding to all three of them now, probably specifically to James and John, most importantly. But he's responding to all of them now. And he's telling them with, with what mostly comes across to me as, as pity. He seems to be saying this with pity in his voice a little bit, that they've not assessed the situation correctly. Jesus seems to be saying to them that they've misread things. You do not know what you are asking, he says. Now, I want to pause here for just a minute because I think there's at least one good thing we can say about, about Salome and, and about James and about John. I don't want to just say negative things about them. I think there are some good things we can say. I think we can credit them at least 
for believing Jesus when it comes to some really big things. Because they seem to, be, they seem to truly believe that Jesus is, is one, the Messiah. They, they, that's important that they believe that. Two, that he's a king. The way they treat him, the way they, um, the way they ask for this, the way they posture themselves when they come to him. And third, they really seem to believe that he will shortly come into his kingdom and keep his promise. They believe he will keep his promise, that he can keep this promise to set them on 12 thrones to rule with him. And those are not small things. That's, that's impressive that they have that kind of faith. Much of that, much of that faith, much of that belief, regardless of, of how poorly they've understood the teachings and the words of Jesus to this point, much of those promises they are taking by faith. Much of that is, is based on trusting Jesus and on trusting his track record for past things, for things in the future that they can't yet see. And so I think it's fair to ask ourselves, how am I doing with that kind of trust? How am I doing with, do, do I trust Jesus? Do I trust his past track record in Scripture and in my life? Does that help me trust him for the things in the future that I can't see? I think we need to credit them for their, for their faith. And so that's a good thing. But the bad thing is that they're concerned with status and importance. The bad thing is that they're, they're caught up in selfishness and self-importance and self-promotion. The bad thing is that they're preoccupied with their own glory and greatness more than they are with his. And what makes matters worse is that they, they still don't understand how God sees greatness. Because they know Jesus is great. They know Jesus is coming into his glory. They know that much. And so they want to be close to him. They want to be close to the powerful person. But they don't yet know why or how he's coming into his glory. They still don't understand that, that to God, greatness looks like a child. Greatness looks like a humble son who knows his place. Greatness looks like a son who isn't self-centered, but instead honors his father, who doesn't lean on his own strength, but is dependent on his father, who doesn't lean on his own understanding, but trusts his father, who doesn't do what he pleases, but obeys his father. And they still don't understand that there's no one else on earth who is doing this better than Jesus. Greatness looks like Jesus. But Jesus knows they don't yet get the why and the how of his coming into glory. He knows they don't get it yet. And Jesus also knows that what they're asking for isn't really his to give. And so Jesus says, you do not know what you are asking. Some of you have watched The Chosen, and our family just finished season one uh, last week. We were all watching it together, and there was a line in the last episode that really made me laugh, uh, because the scene, is, the scene has Peter wondering out loud to Jesus why Jesus even bothers asking him questions if he already knows what's going on in Peter's head. Peter's like, why do you even ask me? And, and I love... The way the character who plays Jesus responds this way to Peter. Simon, he says, everyone here knows what you're thinking most of the time. It does not take God's wisdom. <laughs> I like that. I thought that was good. And, and the, point is, the point is, neither does it take God's wisdom to see that James and John and Salome don't know what they're asking. It doesn't take a mind reader to see that they don't yet grasp the connection between Jesus' prediction of suffering and death just a moment before and the reason, the reason Jesus would be so greatly glorified because if they had grasped it, if they had seen the connection, they would never have asked to be seated so close to Jesus. Not in a million years. And I say that because the first way to be great like Jesus the first way to get glory like Jesus, the first way to be like Jesus is to expect suffering. To expect suffering. God the Son comes to earth to humbly honor His Father, 
to humbly trust his Father, to humbly obey his Father in all things. And part of doing that includes the expectation of suffering. Philippians chapter 2 tells us that 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 required the Son of God to, to humble himself and suffer even to the point of death on a cross. And so now Jesus looks at the three of them standing there and he asks them a very terrifying question. Look with me again at verse 22. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink, he asks. You know, in many Old Testament passages, the cup was a familiar symbol that meant to take everything in, to take everything in, and the, the everything that cup was most often filled with was sorrow, suffering, and the outpouring of God's wrath and judgment. Are you able to drink this cup? For instance, in the Old Testament, in, in Psalm 75, 7, and 8, we read, it is, it is God who executes judgment, putting down one and lifting up another, For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup with foaming wine, well mixed, and he pours out from it, and all the wicked of the earth shall drain it down to the dregs. Likewise, we read in Jeremiah 25, 15, and 16, Thus the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me, Take from my hand this cup of wine of wrath, and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. They shall drink and stagger and be crazed because of the sword that I am sending among them. Again, we read in Isaiah 51, verses 21 and 22. Therefore, hear this, you who are afflicted, you who are drunk, but not with wine. Thus says the Lord, the Lord your God, who pleads the cause of his people. Behold, I have taken from your hand the cup of staggering, the bowl of my wrath, You shall drink no more. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink, Jesus asks? They said to him, we are able. We are able. Now, of course, we know that these disciples cannot drink the cup of God's wrath that Jesus has come to drink. I hope we know that. We know that only Jesus, the perfect Lamb of God, can take that cup from His Father's hand for all who want to be saved. He's the only one who can do it. He alone can take the foaming wine of God's anger for sin, well mixed, and drain it down to the dregs Himself. He's the only one. He alone is able to endure the eternal weight of suffering that so many deserve, which was condensed into a six-hour hell and poured out on him on a cross just a few days from now outside of Jerusalem. You know, it was so terrible. It was so terrible that, that even Jesus himself will ask his Father if there's another way to his glory. It's so terrible that that Jesus himself will pray in a garden not long from now, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Can these disciples then really drink that cup? No, no, not a chance. Not a chance. That cup is Christ's alone to drink, and he will drink it. And because he suffers the most, He is glorified the most. But, as one commentator put it, Jesus' cup would spill over upon his followers in a smaller measure. And so he was warning them, Do you want to follow me? Do you want to sit in glory on my right hand or on my left? Then get ready, because you will participate in my sufferings first. As Paul will, will say later in 2 Timothy 2.12, if we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. As Paul will later say in Romans 8.18, the suffering of this present time, the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. As Peter will later affirm in 1 Peter 5.10, after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to His eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, 
strengthen, and establish you. In other words, Jesus is saying, if you want to be great in God's eyes, if you want to be like me, if, if you want to experience the spillover of my glory, you must first expect the spillover of my suffering. There are no shortcuts. There are no shortcuts. And so I think it's, I think it's that cup of spillover suffering that Jesus is referring to when he now says this in verse 23. He said to them, you will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. And you know, when we read ahead in the scriptures, we see that these men do drink that cup of suffering. They do. We know with Jesus what they don't even know at this moment, because just as Jesus can look forward and see it, we can look back and see that James was the first of the twelve to be killed for the sake of Christ. Acts 12.2 tells us that Herod Agrippa I killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And as for John, the last we hear of him is as a prisoner exiled on the island of Patmos where he writes the last book of the Bible that we call Revelation. You will drink my cup, Jesus says to them. And you know, we must expect to drink the cup of that spillover suffering too if we want to be like Jesus. If we, if we also expect to share in his glory, we have to expect to share in his suffering. But just as that suffering looked different for James than it did for John, so I, I don't think it will always look the same for all of us. William Barclay talks about a Roman coin that was found by archaeologists, and, and on this coin there was a picture of an ox. And the ox is facing two things in this picture on the coin. The ox is facing on this side, he's facing an altar. And the ox on this side is facing a plow. And the coin has on it this inscription, ready for either. Ready for either. In other words, the ox has to be ready for either the extreme moment of sacrifice on the altar or the long labor of the plow on the farm. And so it is with us. So it is with us. We have to be ready too. Whether Jesus ends up, whether following Jesus for you ends up looking more like the life of James or, or the life of John, whether following Jesus ends up looking more like some dramatic public stand or the slow burn of a lifetime in the trenches in a cubicle, or in the workplace, in a school, in a difficult marriage. The, the point is, either way, there are no shortcuts to glory. But still, we instinctively look for them, don't we? I know I do, because that's the way of sin. That's, that's, the, way of, that's the way of him who was our father, the devil. Because he too took a shortcut and made a play for a throne, didn't he? Yes, he did. He too sought his own glory with no thought to God's. And then in a garden, he got humanity to follow in his footsteps. And in a wilderness, when, when Christ came to walk the long road that Adam failed to walk, the devil again suggested to him the same shortcuts to glory. He suggested turning fasting into feasting. He suggested turning danger into drama. He suggested turning himself into a savior without suffering. Just take it, he says to Jesus. Just take it. The kingdoms of the world and their glory, all without a cross. Just take it. Satan magnifies the end, which is a throne, writes Warren Wearsby, but he does not magnify the means to that end. And in chapter 18, the devil is at it again. He, he lurks behind the thoughts and words of Peter, who steps between Jesus and Jerusalem and tells him to spare himself instead of suffering to the death. Get behind me, Satan, Jesus says to Peter there. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And that's exactly what James and John are doing too. They are in this moment, setting their minds on the things of man instead of on the things of God. They want the glorious ends without the Christ-like means. 
And we do this too. We, if we're honest, if we're honest, we all want this too. Truly the flesh lusteth against the spirit in all God's children, writes Bishop J.C. Ryle. The flesh ever seeks to be glorified before it is crucified, writes Martin Luther. And so we only want to follow Jesus so long as it means people like us and we're popular. But not if it means we're canceled, much less crucified. We only want to follow Jesus so long as it gets us respected and honored and admired. But not if it gets us fired. We only want to follow Jesus so long as people see us as friendly and winsome. But not when people see us as bigots and racists, and homophobes the moment we speak truth. And so in recent years, in recent years, we've seen many who once called themselves disciples and Christians walk away from Jesus. There are many who, who came up to him and thoughtlessly said, yes, we are able to drink your cup, only to walk away the moment they tasted the first sip. They were, they were like the foolish man who started building a house before counting the cost. They were like the rocky soil or the, or the soil with weeds that didn't expect the coming hardship. And so the seed of God's word fell on them, but their roots were never established in the deep soil that expected a hot sun. Or the seed of God's word fell on them, but their stocks never grew expecting the weedy cares of the world to pose any threat. So that in the end, neither one produced fruit. And so if, if we've come to Jesus and asked to follow him, I think, friends, I think we should first admit to him that we have probably been foolish too. That we also have probably asked too lightly. I don't know about you, I, I, I don't know, I can't remember hearing many gospel messages, many gospel presentations that talked about suffering, that talked about the hard road. I think we have to admit that we've, I think we should ask him to help us grow and produce fruit, that we should ask him to help us by his power and by his grace to, to help us put down deep roots and to guard our hearts from the things that would choke out our love for him. Because I think most of us have asked him too lightly for the things we ask. Because if we want to follow Jesus, and if we, if we want to be like Jesus, we need to understand one of the clear things we're asking for up front. We're asking to follow after him in his sufferings. One of the things we're asking is to take up our cross when we follow him. Now, of course, of course, yes, in the end, in the end, we're going to get much, much more than we've ever lost or we've ever had taken away from us in this life. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account, Jesus says to his disciples on the Sermon on the Mount. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. And so, and so yes, in the end, we will all agree 100% with Jesus, and we'll all agree with Paul that the suffering wasn't even worth comparing with the far greater glory that will be revealed to us. But in the meantime, in the meantime, though filled with Christ's joy, though filled with Christ's peace, though filled with Christ's presence, if we want to be like him, we must expect to suffer. He said to them, you will drink my cup. But now the other reason that Jesus says James and John don't know what they're asking is because the specifics they're asking for really aren't his to give in the first place. Jesus, Jesus can promise them they'll share in his glory generally if they also share in his suffering. He's just said that. But he can't promise them any specific positions of glory or reward like the ones that they have requested, the, the thrones in this case that are immediately to his right and to his left. No, no, he says, now, you will drink my cup, that much I can tell you, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. This, this word for preparation here means to make ready. 
It's, it's a very similar word in Greek to the word found in Ephesians 2.10 where Paul tells us that God has prepared in advance good works for us to do. And so it seems that just, just as God has already prepared for you good works to do in your life, He has already also prepared for you particular rewards and a particular place of honor in His kingdom. Now I suppose... I suppose God the Father's preparation of this heaven, heavenly seating chart could be based on something completely unrelated to suffering. I mean, it, it, He's God. It could be related to other things. But I think it also seems very likely that it's based on whoever, whoever He's already prepared to suffer the most in this life after Jesus. In other words, whoever suffers most next to Jesus will be glorified next to Jesus, as John MacArthur puts it. And so, whoever suffered most next to him will also be seated most closely to him. I think that's a, I think that's a, a good possibility. I've often wondered who will be the greatest in heaven, MacArthur writes. The, the only possible answer to me is the one who suffered the most to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ. It certainly won't be anyone who has sought glory by political power play or audacious, audacious ambition, he says. And so, whatever the case, James and John have again missed the point. They've missed the point, which is that Jesus is on earth to live like a child. He's on earth to live as a son who is in submission to his father's will, which means that only his father can promise or pass out the rewards that they are seeking. And so Jesus' point to them now is this, that their request is both out of his hands and their request is also out of order, like their hearts. It's out of order, guys. This morning we've spent a lot of time looking at the first way to be like Jesus, which is to expect suffering. Expect suffering. And so it's, it's probably a good thing that next Sunday we're going to take a quick break from Matthew's Gospel and have a special guest come and speak to us about how to deal with anxiety. It's probably good timing. It's providential. But then the week after that, we're going to come back to this passage. We're going to come back to this, and at that point, we're going to look at the second way to be like Jesus that is laid out in this passage, which is to live a life of service. To be great in God's eyes means to be like Jesus, and the two ways we are shown to be like Jesus in this text are to expect suffering, and then, as we'll see next time, to exercise serving. That's what we'll talk about the next time we come together in Matthew. You know, Jesus is going to go on here to speak to James and John. He's going to gather the other disciples to him who are, at this point, understandably angry when they hear about this power play that's just been made behind their backs. But I wonder, I wonder when I read this story, I wonder what happened to Salome. I always wonder a little bit, how did, this, how did the outcome of this conversation set with her after the disciples go off to talk with Jesus? Was, was, she, was she embarrassed by the words of Jesus here? Was she, was she a little bit irritated at the words of Jesus here? Was she confused by the words of Jesus here? You know, my guess is that she probably felt a little bit of all three. And so maybe it wasn't until another afternoon, not too far from now, that, that the gravity of Christ's words finally hit home for her. Maybe it wasn't until the day she was listed there among the other women near Christ's cross, staring up at Jesus, that his words finally found their mark. The cries of three men have filled the air, punctuated by the sounds of hammer blows, ringing off nails that pierce hands and feet. And, these, and then these three men have been lifted up and their, their crossbeams secured to the vertical posts that are permanently in position on Golgotha's heights. And there, on the middle cross, hangs Jesus. She sees him there. And to his right and to his left, there are no thrones but crosses. So that maybe, at last, 
She bows her head in that moment and agrees with Jesus that indeed she hadn't known what she was asking. We ask that our souls may be saved and go to heaven when we die, writes J.C. Ryle. It is a good request indeed. But are we prepared to take up the cross and follow Christ? Are we, are we willing to give up the world for his sake? Are we ready to put off the old man and put on the new to, to fight, to labor, and to run so as to obtain? Are we ready to withstand a taunting world and endure hardships for Christ's sake? What shall we say? What shall we say if we are not so ready? Our Lord might say to us also, Ye know not what ye ask. We ask God that he would make us holy and good. It is a good request indeed. But are we prepared to be sanctified by any process that God in his wisdom may call on us to pass through? Are we ready to be purified by affliction, weaned from the world by bereavements, drawn nearer to God by losses, sicknesses, and sorrow? Alas, he writes, these are hard questions. But if we are not ready, our Lord might well say to us as well, ye know not what ye ask. Let's pray.